All right. Welcome back, everyone. I guess the uh, crowd is thinning a little bit the, uh, as midterm week and such approach. But nevertheless, we've got uh, back into things here. Um, welcome back. A uh, couple of things before we get before we get started here. Just a, a couple of announcements. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna have slides today because I'll be doing everything with through uh, code and GCC. So, so the announcements for today. We have uh, assignment three uh, came in on Tuesday. Hard deadline was last night. Hopefully that all kind of you all saw that through. Lots of practice on void stars. Lots of pointers and memory management. Um, so now we are um, into assignment four, which has been up for a little while. Already got a few questions on that, which is always good to see students starting early and getting a, getting a good head start on that. That's coming in in uh, Tuesday of next week. And um, while you are allowed to use the normal hard deadline for that assignment, it is the, the more time you take working on assignment four is going to ultimately mean less time for uh, working, um, studying for your exam that is coming up a week from today. That exam is in class. Hopefully this is not, or it's during class. It will be split between two rooms. The information is on the website. And there's a practice exam in the back uh, printed out also that is posted on the website. So that should give you a sense both for the material on the exam and for um, what the, the logistics are going to be. It's kind of, a, I guess, a, just a quick kind of brief sort of focus on, on what, we're, what we're looking for with the exams. We're hoping that the exam is going to look a lot like the kind of work that you've been doing on the assignments and the lab so far. Um, we're not going to try to pull it. Our, our goal is to have for there to be no surprises, right? It's not going to be that you will show up and there will be suddenly this function that you've never heard of and you've never used before that you've had you know, nothing to do with um, thus far. Um, the, the, code, the code that you will be writing and the, the pointers that you'll be working through, the, um, the concepts that you'll be tested on are hopefully going to be very familiar because they are precisely the things you've spent um, so much time on throughout throughout the quarter. Um, so hopefully you will see that from the practice exam and you know feel like this is something that you can you can walk in to the exam next week kind of ready for. Okay. So all right, let's get into it uh, for today. So last time we started talking about assembly and we talked about. Uh, the move instruction. First, we introduced the uh, the notion of assembly at all. We introduced our and our particular assembly language and our system, our x86-64. We talked about registers, and then we spent uh, the majority of our time last time talking about the move instruction. And we saw a variety of ways to access data to access our memory. So we saw you'll recall the the moves of you know immediate and addressing modes. And so today we're going to kind of we're going to keep that going. We're going to look at a bunch of different instructions, a bunch of different translations of C code. So recall that our our ultimate goal with assembly isn't going to be to sit down and just crank out a bunch of assembly ourselves, but we really want to be thinking about how does C code translate to assembly and vice versa. How can I look at a piece of C code and know what will happen? on the machine when that code is executed? And how do I look at a piece of assembly and know what kind of C code went into generating that. So today we're going to look at the kind of a, a few operations. We're going to look at uh, arithmetic and logical operations. We're going to look at some of the control structures. Um, and the next time we will continue and talk about uh, function calls and other other C constructs. All right. So I'll kind of be switching between um, GCC Explorer and uh, and actually showing you the code live. But for now, let's go ahead and start back up in, in GCC Explorer. So last time, we ended our discussion with a little bit on typecast. And I want to review that here. So let's, let's just get into it. So I'll write a function. Whoops, I'm in. Oh, wow. Oh, oh, oh. hold on. Hello, are you going to? 
One second. What's going on? Uh, that's unfortunate. Hmm? Yeah. Oh, you know what it's gonna be? Yeah, I did. Oh, this is... Here, you know what it's gonna be is? It's gonna be this. Hang on, sorry. Ah. <laughs> Whoa. Uh, I'm typing it, but it's not, it's not respecting my caps lock. There we go. Sorry about that. Where are we here? Sorry about that. That was unfortunate. Um, do I go one more normally? Okay. All right, let's get back into it. Sorry about that. So here we've got a function. We're gonna have it take a pointer. And then we started talking. So here's just a quick review of the move instruction that we were seeing last time. Where, so we've got um, we're going to access now this this instruction might look a little wacky, right? It's star of pointer plus three. And, and if you recall from our discussions of pointer arithmetic, this is actually just an array access. This would just be equivalent to pointer bracket three. But, um, you know, well, but I'll show you why I'm doing it. Like, I'm writing it like this on purpose um, in a moment. So here we've got a function. Uh, it takes a long star and returns a long, and it's going to it's going to return star of pointer plus three. And so you so hopefully this looks somewhat familiar from last time. We have a uh, we're doing a move. It's an eight byte move because we have a Q suffix here. And then um, starting with the first parameter RDI, we add twenty four and dereference it. Remember this wacky syntax where we put the twenty four outside of the parentheses. And that means that we add 24 and dereference it. OK? And then we move the value into our return, our return value location, which is rex. You good on this? Is there any follow-up from this? OK. So the question that I want to ask here is, right now we're doing pointer arithmetic and a dereference on a, um, on a long star. Um, and, and the question I want to ask is actually, whoops, I want to, I'm not actually going to return it. I'm going to actually just set it to zero. That's fine. Uh, we're going to do this. We're just going to say equals zero. So same move of the 24, but now we're moving a zero into it, right? And my question is going to be, what if I take pointer and I cast it as a care star? What will change about the assembly? So now we're doing pointer arithmetic on a care star, and now we're dereferencing a care star. And you'll notice that there are two things that did change. Um, the, the two things that I pointed out, actually. Now instead of moving a, a, an 8 byte value, we're moving a single byte value. So that's a move B instead of a move Q. And instead of adding 24, which was 3 times 8, right, um, which is how we do pointer arithmetic on a long, we add, uh, we add 3 bytes. But in general, nothing really changed about the assembly in terms of we're still looking at RDI for the, for the first parameter, and we're still going to move a zero there. Um, and more generally, the typecast itself does not get its own instruction. Right? All the typecast does is it causes the compiler to interpret our code a little differently. Um, and so you can imagine kind of looking, so you can imagine kind of putting, um, and this, so this applies, so this example applies to pointers, but we can think of this happening for, and we'll see a few of um, later where if I, depending on the type information, 
um, is largely lost when I go to assembly. And all we really have left in assembly are the actual mechanics of moving around in memory in increments of bytes and um, how, you know, accessing, accessing different pieces of memory in one, two, four, or eight byte chunks. Um, and that's all that's going to be left over um, of, our, of the type system when we finally get down to assembly. All right, any questions about that? Okay. Okay, so now I wanna introduce uh, our next kind of uh, major uh, instruction. So I'm actually gonna copy this, and we're gonna do something a little bit different here. So we're gonna do this. I'll call this move, um, and here I'll actually do return. I'll, I'll, I'll do that one, okay? Um, and I'll actually just do a return of plus one. Okay, I should try not to. Okay, so here I'm. So I'll, I'll leave this example here for your reference. But now, so all the examples that we saw so far were using a move. We said, and when we accessed memory, we actually wanted this dereference, right? When we said that when we did a move queue of the, oops, oh, it's not gonna compile. Um, if we do a move queue and we, we dereference, this parentheses implies a dereference. But now I want to see, but what happens if I want to return an address instead? So here, instead of returning dereference of pointer plus one, I actually just want to say return pointer plus one, the address, right? So I'm going to move one forward. Um, I'm going to move one long ahead in memory. So what we see here is we see a new instruction. This instruction is called LEA. LEA stands for load effective address. Load effective address. And what this is going to do is it looks just like move. Notice the syntax is the same um, in, in the same way. But now we're not going to dereference. So this is the kind of one special case where the parentheses here will not actually mean dereference. In any other situation, when you see a, this is, you know, a, an indirect with displacement addressing mode, that's what we call this, right? Because we have, we start with a register and we, we displace it. So we offset it by, by eight bytes in this case. In any other situation, we would, we would expect a dereference here. We would go to that location in memory and get the value back. LEA does not do that. LEA just adds eight to RDI, eight being the number of bytes, and then stores that value in RAX. Okay. And so here you can see, here is an, another place where we could see that if I cast this uh, pointer, um, well, if I cast it to a character, I'll probably get a warning um, for casting it back, but yeah, I'll get a warning for casting it back, but we can see that the change is, is consistent, that casting pointer um, not really going to have an impact other than, well, now I have to add one byte instead of adding eight, right? But I'll get rid of that warning, so. All right. All right, so just to kind of, the LEA instruction, we'll see it come up again later, but for now it's just, it, it's, it is how we're going to, it's how we're going to compute addresses. So in some cases where you have, um, where if we use an ampersand, it's pretty hard to come up to get a good example of this because a lot of stuff is being stored in registers. But a lot of times, um, if you're going to, if you need to take the address of something, like so, I could I could rewrite this right to ampersand of array bracket one, and that's going to be the same thing, right? Um, we know that, and, and this is actually showing us, reminding us that ampersand of of pointer bracket one is the same as just doing pointer plus one. All right, so now I want to I want to move on and show you just some of the ways that we can do other operations. So I'll just kind of uh, sort of a whirlwind tour of arithmetic and logical operations. Uh, I'm certainly not going to go through all of them. Um, that's you know all of the or, or not even all the ones that really kind of are that you'll run into. Um, there is a 
a one sheet on the website that gives you kind of a, a rundown of, of the most important instructions. Um, so I'll just, but I'll just show you a few. And I'll return local. Okay, so here I want to show you the add instruction. All right, so over here, so we see a, so I'm doing everything, now I'm mostly going to be doing a lot of stuff on ints today. Um, I did a lot of things with longs last time because I wanted to keep the move constant. I just wanted to stay on a move queue. But since most of our, in, our arithmetic and most of our, our interesting kind of code is going to be operating on ints, I mostly want to stay in the int space. So we'll see a lot of move L's, we'll see a lot of E such and such registers. So here you can see that I've got, I've, I've, I'm moving uh, EDI, which is my first parameter, one of the first parameters in int, into EAX, and then I'm going to add dereference RDX to it. So two things to note. The add instruction, so notice it's an add L, just like move, most instructions will take a suffix. That, so add takes the L suffix, meaning we are adding four byte things. And what this actually does is just like move, we've got kind of a source destination pattern. And what that does is it will take destination plus equals the source. So this is a little weird, right? This is not a kind of, this is, you know, you might expect this to take three arguments and, you know, put the destination somewhere else. But that's just, that's not how the hardware, that's not how our hardware wants to do ads. That's not convenient for the hardware. So all of, the arithmetic and logical units, like all of the, the, the instructions are going to look like, look like this. It's going to be kind of a plus equals or a minus equals. Um, the other thing that is noteworthy here that you're seeing is RDX is the third parameter. So here we dereference uh, our pointer. So dereferencing RDX means um, dereferencing pointer, and we add that to prime one. And the return value goes in EAX, we're turning an int. Is this okay? Questions? Questions? Yep. So, like, what is prime 2 in this case in relation to the pointer? Uh, what's param 2? So, what, what do you mean, what is it in relation to the pointer? Because we don't use it to add it onto. Yeah, so right now, param 2 isn't being used at all. Oh. Um, it would be stored in, our, in ESI. I'll show you where I'm about to use it, but I just, I just wanted to write the prototype for the whole function for now. Um. Yep. Does ret by default return what's in EAX? Aha. Uh -huh. So the question is, does ret by default return what's in EAX? No. We should be very clear about what ret does. Ret does not do anything with the return value. The, the rule for function calls is that if the function will return a value, that value should be in EAX or RAX if I'm returning a long or AX if I'm returning short. It should be in RAX or some subregister of RAX. Ret doesn't care. All ret does is it says, I'm done with this function, go back to the, per the function who called me. But it's not looking at the RAX. Um, what will happen, and we'll see this on Monday, is that the function that calls Arith will look in EAX after it has called the function to get the value back out. That kind of makes sense? Yeah. Question. Yep. So when we have local variables, how yes. exactly does like the tree it? Because we're not, it doesn't seem like we're actually making a local variable to hold the result of it. Yeah, so the, the question is how, where, how exactly are local variables handled? Because we declared it local and it's not actually being set, it's not set aside at all. Um, with more and more complicated functions, local variables will need to get some space. And that space could come in the form of a register. We could assign some other register that we're not using. There are, you know, 14 registers that we're not using, or I guess 13, right, that, uh, that we're not using. Um, and we could use one of them to hold our local variable. Um, but in this case, we're basically going to let EAX double as the register to store our local and as um, the, you know, the place where the return value is going to go, which happens to be convenient because if I look at the, the code, I'm returning local. So if I just put local in EAX, I'm done. Right. So the compiler is smart enough to figure out where it should put the locals to kind of optimize, um, optimize for that. Like, oh, you're just going to return the value? Then I'll just calculate it into EAX. Oh, you need the value for some other function call down the road? Then I'll put it in some other register. And then if you have, for example, an array, we'll see that later, um, then you'll put it on the stack or something. Anything else? 
So now let's let's look at another operation. Here I'll do local two equals. Uh, I'll do local minus param two times param one. Just some just some little calculations that you can see here. I'll return local two here. And so okay, um, these two lines stay the same, right? Um, I could even well, let's 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 dabble in the colorize. So this I'm not going to do this too often, but there's a button up here called colorize. Uh, it usually if I if I do it too often, it's going to be impossible to read. So um, I'll I'll turn it on very sparingly when we just want to see how lines of C map to lines of assembly. And here you can see that the two lines for the declaration of local are are the same as they were before, but now we've got this subtraction and this multiply. So we get the sub instruction and the I mole instruction, which are our subtract and our multiply. And those are mapping to the same um, to this to this line of C. And so the kind of big takeaway point here is that one line of C may very well map to multiple assembly instructions. And that could just be because one of them needs to dereference a pointer, but it could also be because our expression was too complicated to fit into a single assembly instruction. We don't have a subtract and then multiply instruction. We just have a subtract and we have a multiply. And they work the same way as add. They work like they're minus equals and times equals. Right? So the compiler needs to break up this expression and say, okay, what does it mean to compute local minus param two times param one? Well, it means that first I have to do local minus param two, then I multiply by param one. And so it will break that up into these instructions. Um, and it, it does, again, it does all the math on EAX. I'm going to turn off colorize now. It does all the math on EAX because it realizes that ultimately that's where I want the return value to go. Okay? Any questions? Okay. I'm actually going to show you this one. This is a kind of a good place for me to just show you uh, the how this kind of maps to how this maps to GDB here. So here I've got the, the same piece of code, I hope. Yeah, cool. I remembered the code. Uh, so here I've got the same piece of code um, as I wrote in GCC Explorer. And one of the things I just, uh, you know, our focus being on the translation process, GCC Explorer is very convenient for us to look at the code and look at, you know, how changing it changes the assembly. But at the end of the day, what we really want to know is I've got real C code, I type make on it, and I want to see some real assembly come out of that um, and make some sense of it. And so the best way we're actually going to do that is to go back into GDB and get that information sort of straight from the source. So here's the code. Uh, I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll go into GDB with it. And I'll put a breakpoint on the arithmetic function, and I'll run. And so here you can see kind of um, here you can see the the code running. Now, this is hopefully familiar to you in debugging C code. But now, how do we get GDB to tell us information about the assembly? Well, I can use the a new command disassemble, and I can pass it the name of a function, and it will show me the assembly for that function. <coughs> Couple things to note about the assembly that may look a little different from GCC Explorer. First, uh, we've got these kind of addresses. So, so these are the actual kind of addresses of where the where the code is actually in memory. And then you'll notice that we don't have the suffixes that we were seeing uh, on the other view. We have a move and we have an add and we have a sub, but we don't have those L suffixes. So what's up with that? Well, if you look at the move, we're moving EDI into EAX. Both EDI and EAX are 32-bit subregisters, right? They are they are four bytes wide. So if I'm going to move from one of those to the other, that move has got to be a 32-bit move. If I wanted to move a 16-bit thing, then I would need to use DI. If I wanted to move a 64-bit thing, then I would need to use RDI. So just from looking at the instruction. Uh, just from looking at the operands to the move, I can dis deduce what the suffix is going to be. I know that this is going to be a move L. And I know that this is going to be add L because the destination is EAX, and likewise for all these other, for these other instructions. So GDB and a couple other tools are probably not going to show the suffixes as much, um, whereas in Explorer you will see them. Okay? 
Um, the other aspect, another aspect of this is that we can see the kind of this little arrow thing is telling us what assembly instruction we are currently looking at. Um, so, so this is, so we are about to execute this move. And so we can go to the next line of C code. So here down, we're down here at, at local two. Um, if I do the disassemble again, you'll see that I'm, I've in fact executed the two lines that correspond to that, that first, um, that first uh, line of C. And I can print out the value of local, but by looking at the assembly, I also know that local is, is basically being stored in EAX, right? We saw that the, the calculation of um, param1 plus D reference of pointer was being stored in EAX. So I can print out the value of a register. And so I'll do that by typing print dollar EAX. This is really weird. Uh, everywhere else in assembly, registers are going to have percent signs in front of them. And the dollar sign means immediate, right? It means it's a constant. In GDB, it is different. In GDB, if I want to print out the value of a register, then I need to print, I need to use a dollar sign in front of the register name. So here I can print dollar sign EAX, and we see that in fact, the value of local, which is stored in EAX, um, matches here. So EAX contains the value four, which happens to be the value of local. Now, why is that important? Why, why do we even go through this process, right? Like, who cares if I can just print out local, everything's fine. But there are cases where you can't. There are cases where you try to print out local, you've probably run into, you may have run into a couple, where you print out a variable and it says, oh, I'm sorry, that's optimized out. So what do you do? Well, now, if, if the function is really complicated, maybe you, you know, there, it's, it might be a little harder, but if the function is simple, if it's one of your helper functions, if it's just a little pointer arithmetic, you could just, you could pretty easily actually just disassemble the function, figure out where the value got calculated and just print it out straight from the register. Here's kind of a neat example of that. Just kind of a, a one, one quick example of that. So let's say I accidentally, I, I step through to the end of the function, and now I'm at the end of the function and I say, oh, shoot, I got to the end of the function and I forgot to check what it returned. Like, what did this function return? You know, GDB didn't print it out um, and I don't know. Well, I know that whenever a function returns, if it has a return value, the return value is in EAX. So I can just print out the value of dollar $EAX and that, will, that is actually, you can, you can look at the code and, and do the math. The code is on, uh, in, the, in AFS right now. Um, that is actually the correct return value. So we can use our knowledge of assembly um, and of kind of how the machine is executing our code to, to debug it, to kind of get pieces of information that, you know, asking GDB would, it won't, we won't be able to get. Um, yep. Is there really only one EAX per sort of computer or does each program kind of create a registry for that? Ah, so the question is, is there only one EAX per computer? Roughly speaking, the answer is yes. Um, but then the, there's a lot of hardware and software behind the scenes that makes it look like each of our programs has a separate set. But internally on the machine, there really is one set of registers and those are actually the registers that we're executing on. Um, this is assuming a single core machine. I guess if you have a dual core machine, then maybe you have more registers and more stuff, but that's, that's the model we're working with anyway. Okay, anything else? So that's just a quick kind of, you know, part of the goal here is just to show you that yes, indeed, like the, the code that we're looking at in GCC Explorer is real, it's coming out uh, in our programs. We can view it in GDB. I'll come back to GDB at the end to show you how, you know, we can debug something more, more interesting, but just kind of giving you a glimpse of how we can print out registers and kind of move around um, and, and kind of look at, look at what's happening in the assembly level um, in, in an environment that you're maybe a little more familiar with. So let's uh, do another couple of operations. I'm actually going to, just to save some space, I'm actually gonna cut this top part. I will put the whole, I'll put the whole, um, the whole piece of code up after a lecture, but I'll, I'll, I'll be a little more aggressive about kind of removing functions that I don't wanna look at as much, um, just to save some space. So here, let me show you a couple of bitwise operators. Mask. I'll have it. 
I'll say uh, val is and with. So I'll, I'll use a bitwise and with a bitwise not, and I'll return val right shift by two. Okay. So a couple more instructions to be seen here. So here, just a, just a kind of a intro to some more instructions. We've got the not instruction, which is our tilde. So this is different from the negative. This is different from taking a negative. So not is bitwise negation. That's tilde, right? Um, there's another instruction called neg, which is the arithmetic negation. But, um, and then and works exactly the way that add, subtract, multiply did. It's an and equals, which I've conveniently written that way. Um, you actually notice that the, the and is going straight into EAX. It, like, there's, yeah, so basically, um, the compiler just decides that it doesn't need to put the value back into EDI um, just so that it can return it later. Um, we're just going to do all the math on EAX again because that's just that's that's where the answer needs to go. And then here, the la the last instruction that you see here is an SAR. That's a right shift. Okay. But now. Here's where kind of an interesting, here's where kind of an interesting uh, issue comes up, which is so I've been doing everything in terms of signed ints, right? And you might ask, well, what happens if I change some of these variables to unsigned? So I'll change mask to unsigned, and you'll see that the code did not change. <coughs> and in fact, I'm actually going to go back and change. I could go back and change these local variables to unsigned. And you'll see that the code for that is also not going to change. The reason, and this was the motivation behind two's complement, right? We spent this huge lecture talking about this fancy new way of representing signed numbers. And one of the big ways we wanted to, one of the big kind of benefits we talked about with choose complement was that addition and subtraction, multiplication use the same logic as when we were representing unsigned numbers. We can just add. And, you know, whether it's signed or unsigned, it doesn't matter because, you know, that's kind of what choose complement was, was giving us. So as it turns out, on the hardware, there is not a separate instruction for add signed and add unsigned. There's just one. It's add. And whether you choose to interpret the result as a signed or an unsigned number, that's on you. Right? That's on, I guess, the compiler. That's on the code. But it's not going to be up to the hardware. And so just another example of where type information gets lost in C. Right? I don't actually know now which variables are signed and which ones are unsigned. I can't even tell if the parameters are signed anymore. But there were a couple differences, recall, between signed and unsigned numbers, and one of them was the right shift. When I do a right shift of a signed number, we said that we wanted, a right, we wanted to fill with a copy of the signed bit. But if I right shift an unsigned number, we want to fill with zeros. So if I make a change to, un, to val here, you'll see that the code down here does change. That now, instead of an SAR, we have an SHR. So what we actually learned is that SAR is what's called an arithmetic right shift. That is, it operates, it does the signed right shift, where I fill with a copy of the sign bit. And then SHR is a right shift that depends on, that is the kind of the logical or unsigned version, where I fill with zeros. So in this place, right, so the hardware does, still doesn't know whether the value is signed or unsigned, but the compiler does. So GCC, looking at this code, says, aha, you have an unsigned int that you are right shifting by two. I need to generate an SHR. And whereas if you had a signed int and you right shifted it by two, I would need to generate an SAR. So when it matters, the compiler will get it right. Questions?
Okay. So let's see. And so, okay, so the kind of, there's kind of this follow up to this, which is as we keep kind of going down more and more instructions, we're starting to realize that, you know, the hardware is just operating on bytes, right? It doesn't really care whether those bytes are signed ints or unsigned ints or, you know, longs versus pointers versus any of that. And when we start kind of realizing this, then we start actually being able to do some really kind of clever things. So here I'm going to actually do, I want to do something, uh, I'm going to recall our discussion of the LEA uh, instruction. Well, here's one, something interesting that I could do. Remember that we used LEA as part of our, as doing pointer arithmetic. We said, oh, if I'm going to do pointer plus three, then we'll LEA um, to compute an address that kind of does our, and it does our pointer arithmetic. But what if I have just two ints? Um, but actually, let's say I do something like param2 times four. And then maybe I do, I'll just do, I don't know, five plus. So uh, you can see that I've kind of written the, the code here in a very specific way, but it doesn't actually matter that I wrote it in that way. But here we can actually see what happened is we do generate an LEA. Now this should, at first it's like, whoa, what happened there? Like, how did it decide, like, why is that okay? I thought LEA was all about loading addresses. We're clearly not working with addresses here. We've got two ints and we're turning an int. But what LEA is really doing was, it was just doing kind of arithmetic on seemingly addresses, at least as we presented it, but addresses are just numbers behind the scenes. They're just integers. Everything that we've been doing so far has just been math on integers. And so we can do math on these integers using the same instruction. So LEA here is actually going to allow us to compute this, you know, this interesting, this kind of linear equation, right? I can do, and you can kind of work that out, right? Param one plus param two times four uh, plus this five in front. Um, and the compiler's gonna be pretty aggressive about, uh, about using LEA when it can. It's just a really convenient way to, to just add a couple numbers together. Um, and then I should note that it's also technically, it's also possible, uh, I'm not sure how often it's really gonna happen, but it's also possible for the compiler to use add instructions and use kind of the, the arithmetic and bitwise instructions that we saw to do the pointer math, right? If we had some pointer and we needed to add some, some amount to it, we need to subtract, subtract some amount from it, we could totally be using add and subtract. So all these instructions are, are pretty interchangeable in the sense that all I have to think about is what is the computation that I want to end up with? I want to end up with a plus b times four. Okay, LEA seems pretty good. Question? Yep. Why do we use um, RDI and RSI? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So the question is why does LEA use RDI and RSI here um, instead of EDI and ESI? LEA by design, this, these addressing modes, right, this uh, displacement and scaled index mode is designed for accessing memory. And so when we want to access memory, our, um, our sort of the, we're going to end up needing to use eight byte addresses, right? Our pointers are all eight bytes. So the hardware is just designed to, to accept uh, eight byte registers when doing any kind of uh, any kind of addressing mode, and that includes for LEA. So you could you you should not really see any E registers inside of these parentheses inside of an addressing mode. Now then, maybe the follow-up question is, well, hey, what? How does this work then? Right? You're doing this eight this math on eight byte things, and you're storing the result in a four byte thing. How does that have any meaning? Well. What we basically do is we ignore the upper four bytes. So we take the RDI and RSI times four, um, add the five, we get some eight byte result, we throw away the upper four, and we just stick the value into EAX. And that's gonna be okay. It might sound a little wasteful, but the hardware is really good at that. The hardware is totally good at working through, going, calculating memory addresses. That's like kind of what it's there for, right? So. Um, so it's going to do the math on the 8-byte thing and then just throw away the upper 4 and we'll, have, we'll be left with the EAX register. 
Other questions? Alrighty. So kind of the, 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 broad, the broad point here again, you know, numbers are just numbers. Um, types are not coming through quite very clearly. And what are we going to do? You know, we, we, so look at the context, figure out what, what is actually happening. You know, we could not really tell the difference between this math and then um, I guess the 5 kind of gives it away that this probably isn't a pointer math. But if I change this to a 4, then it's, it's much less obvious that this is not just a, some pointer math, right? I should also note, this is something you're going to see in assignment 4, that you're, you're only allowed to scale by so much. You're not actually allowed to put an arbitrary number in here. So um, you can experiment a little, for example, with putting a different constant here. What would happen if I didn't have, uh, if I didn't have 1, 2, 4, 8, which are the only allowed constants? Um, it's kind of interesting. Um, I'd recommend actually putting a 41 there and seeing working out the math. It's very surprising what the compiler does and how it gets us to the right answer, right? The compiler is really, really smart about looking at your code and saying, how should I generate the right set of instructions to get us to the right answer? Um, and it's not always going to be the set of instructions you expect. Um, and sometimes you do actually have to just look at the assembly and really convince yourself, wow, that really does give me the right answer. Who'd have thought? All right. Couple more things here. Let's couple more things on the kind of arithmetic side. So I'm going to I'm going to clear uh, the screen and do something uh, to kind of shift gears a little bit. So if there are any questions about this, now would be a great time to. Yeah. I don't know that your the last arithmetic functions dealing with pointer. Oh, so the question is, like, how would the compiler know it, whether or not the last? So I guess with this function, you know, the compiler is looking at the C code, right? So it looks at this C code and says, we're not dealing with pointers. But it can still use the LEA. That's kind of the point, is even though we're not dealing with pointers, we can still use the LEA to do just kind of straight math. If we were dealing with pointers, the compiler could still use, could use the LEA, or it could use the add and subtract and multiply instructions. Um, but in assembly, we would not know. We would not be able to tell the difference in assembly between whether the function used pointers or not, um, unless we saw a dereference or something. OK? All right. So one thing I do have to show you because it will absolutely come up in all of the assembly in all of the assembly that we're that you're going to be looking at is what happens if I convert from one type to another. Um, so this is similar to the type casting idea, but I'm not going to actually use casts because we don't need them. We're just generally looking at what do, what what do I get when I say take assigned care C and I assign it and I return it as an int. So we need some kind of promotion here. We need some kind of conversion from a one byte thing to a four byte thing. Right. And here we can see the instruction that gets generated. It's a move, still is a move. And we can see that the move parameters look about right. Right. So DIL is the one byte sub-register of RDI, and EAX is the 32-bit sub-register, the 4-byte sub-register of RAX, so that's all consistent. And then the B and the L are also consistent um, with what you'd expect. So this is saying move, so move something, BL, means move from 1 byte to 4 bytes. And what's up with that S now, right? Well, notice that we have a signed care here. So when we promote it to an int, we need to sign extend it. In those three extra bytes that we have, you know, that we now have space for, we need to put copies of the sign bit. Our goal when we promote a signed, a signed number to a bigger type is we want to preserve the 
uh, we want to preserve the value. So if it's negative, we want to keep it negative. If it's positive, we want to keep it positive. So s means sign extend. So move sbl means starting with one byte, sign extend it, and get me to a four byte thing. And so we can actually compare if I use a promotion u. Oops, I obviously have. Oops. <laughs> of unsigned care, and if I here instead return an unsigned care to a long, we can see that there's a similar instruction move zbl, which is to zero extend. Okay, is that okay? And so one common place that this is going to come up, and you know, part of it is like, okay, well, how often are we really moving cares to ints? Well, this is, that's going to come up. But another place that this is going to be super, super common is when we do array accesses. Um, because last time when I did array accesses, I was using longs for my, my index. If I use an int, oh, I even typed long, but I don't want to. I want to use an int now array of i. So if I return array of i, we do the scaled index calculation that you'd expect um, to get to array bracket i, but recall that all pointers are 8 bytes and that therefore the moves are going to all operate on kind of uh, the memory addressing is always done in 8 byte um, with 8 byte addresses. So if I have an integer variable, an, a, a four byte int storing the index, then before I multiply it by four and add it to the, the base address of the array, I need to convert it to a, an eight byte value. So here we see a move SLQ, which following the same pattern, move SLQ means move four bytes to 8 bytes, but sign extend. And that means that if I use a negative array index, that I will continue, that it will, that it will actually get sign extended, it'll stay negative, the multiply will continue to work. Alright? Alright. One more example, alright, I'm just gonna stick with this one. Let's say I change this to an unsigned. Here's where kind of the, 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 the wheels fall off here. I changed this to an unsigned, and you maybe would expect a move ZLQ. And that's not what we got. And we actually saw this, we, we accidentally stumbled on this last time. We get a move of ESI itself. What? Right? That clear, like, that can't be right, right? Maybe the compiler just doesn't know how to do array accesses with unsigned ints. Well, turns out, you know, GCC is, has been developed by, you know, so many people over a few decades now. And sure, there could be obscure kind of edge cases that the compilers know about. It's going to get array accesses right. right. So what is it doing here? As it turns out, if we move a four byte register, uh, if we move of four byte sub, or actually move, if the destination is a four byte subregister like ESI. This will imp automatically zero out the upper four bytes. So yes, this is moving ESI to itself, but incidentally, because the destination, because ESI destination is a four is the four byte subregister, the upper four bytes get get wiped. They get zeroed out. So this is essentially equivalent to move SLQ, um, or sorry, ZLQ, if, if that existed. Um, I'm not sure if it does. I haven't actually seen GCC generate that, because it's much rather do this. Okay? Is that all right? Okay. 
Any? So that's, that's kind of all I have for the uh, arithmetic and logic stuff. Um, I'm now going to go on to control structures. So if there's any questions about kind of just the arithmetic, the, the moves and the adds and, and all that, now would, be, now would be ideal for that. So we've done, we've done, we've seen just kind of how to do some straight line code, but straight line code is not very interesting um, in terms of, you know, it is not, uh, it, it, we're not really, you wouldn't really get very far writing code if you didn't have if statements and you didn't have loops and things like that. So now we're going to explore a kind of different, we're going to switch gears and talk about control structures. We're going to talk about how to write those kind of classic if statements and, and while loops and so on. Now, by way of introduction, not because I think this is good style or anything, it's certainly not, but by way of introduction, I'm going to start with a, I'm going to start with a go-to loop. Star PTR. Oh, thank you. So here we've got star PTR as well. And I'm, so I'm going to say, okay, uh, what, oh. Caps are going to get me here. So here, uh, you're not going to see this come up very much, hopefully, at all in real code. That would be very unfortunate. Um, but, but what we can do is we can use this wacky statement called go to. We can declare a kind of a, a name with a colon, and that will allow us to kind of, um, that'll, that'll basically make this thing, so I can say plus equals one. And and what this thing will do is it will, so in C, I kind of have to introduce what this means in C, where, um, so we initialize pointer to 107, and then we execute this line, pointer plus equals one, start pointer plus equals one, so we, we increment the value that it's, that pointer is pointing to, and then we go back to the top, and we do it again, and we do it again, and we do it again, and there's, there's, no, there's no end in sight on this. But, so hopefully you'll never see this uh, actual kind of code in, in real C, but it's a good way for me to introduce a new assembly construct, which is a jump. So here I've got, so on, on the assembly side, the, the label, so we don't have the name loop anymore. Um, we have this thing L2, and what it, it's gonna mean in Explorer, we'll see what this looks like in GDB later, but what this is gonna mean is this is gonna be a location that we will want to go back to later. And so the way this assembly works is first we move 107 into, into DRF RDI, and then we add one to it, and this jump, JMP stands for jump, it says now start executing instructions from this label. So we're going to go back up, and we're going to execute this add again, and then we're going to execute this jump again. It says, okay, now go back to that label. You're like, okay, back up to the label. Do the add, do the jump, back up to the label. So JMP is what we call an unconditional jump. There's no condition on it. There's no, hey, I should maybe, you know, only do this in certain situations. Um, and, we'll, and so it will, and that's how we're going to, that is, and so this form of kind of jumping to a label with or without conditions is going to be how we move around an assembly. We won't just have like an if instruction. We don't have a, a while loop instruction um, really. What we have is we have these jumps that say now start executing code from this place. So let's see that in a much more useful way. Uh, the go to loop is not really the greatest example of actual useful C code. So um, let's do that. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll say, okay, um, and then we'll go, so I'll say if param is 107, then I'll do param Okay. So here I have a classic, just kind of your, your basic C if statement. And let's see how that's getting generated. Right, so here you see the, so okay. So 
a couple new instructions right away. This is a little, all right, right. So here, let's, let's go through it one by one. So here we've got a compare instruction. CMP means compare. We're comparing EDI to 107. This is weird because remember that all of our instructions so far have been kind of weirdly flipped, like we did source destination when kind of everything else has been in terms of destination source. Yeah, we're going to do that again. So compare uh, B comma A is actually going to compare A to B in this kind of direction. And we'll see where that matters now. For the, in this case, it's not a big deal because we're just using equals versus not equals. But so here we're comparing the value in EDI, which is param, to the constant 107. And then we have a jump. So if it starts with a J, it's probably a jump. But it's not an unconditional one now. We're not just jumping always. We are JNE means jump if not equal. Kind of the oddity here is that, of course, there are two separate instructions. So what exactly is happening um, is happening here is that compare will will do this will do some of the will do the comparison. It actually subtracts um, 107 from EDI, and based on that result, it will set some it'll set some flags. It'll just set another register kind of out out somewhere else, and then when we come along and do this JNE. We'll say, was the, what was the result of the last comparison I did? It was the last comparison a not equals. And if the answer is yes, it was not equal, then we jump over this line and finish off here. You can see the LEA being used to subtract 5 before we return. So this is not this. This is maybe a little different than you might expect the if then to come out. You might have thought this. Maybe you'd expect this to say if they're equal, then do this thing, right? That's what the C code says. If they're equal, then do this extra thing. But the way we're going to say that in assembly is if they're not equal, skip these things. It's much easier for us to skip instructions than it is for us to go to some place and then you know come back later. So what we're going to do is we're going to say if they're if 107 is not equal to EDI, then we will skip the add and start executing down here. Questions about that? OK. OK, so now let's do another thing. Let's, oops, I do want two parameters on this one. OK, let's do that. I probably should have had these ready. Okay. Um, all right, so I'll return to. So here I want to show you now. OK, so that was the if, if then case, right? That was just the if with, um, that was just the if with, Without an else, now I want to show you what it looks like with an else. So let's say I do if param one is I don't know less than five. So we'll see where that um, then and then. Uh, so what did I do here? I just, it doesn't matter. <laughs> or with one, and here I think I did an xor um, param two xor with. Then just more instructions, but. Um, well, what's inside the, the body of the if and the, uh, the then and the else sections don't really matter, right? Um, we're just kind of seeing the general shape, right? That's the first thing we want to do. Um, probably the first thing you're ever going to want to do when you get into a, a piece of assembly code is what is the shape of the, of the, of the code? And, and we'll ask you for this um, when we get to the assignment for assembly is just what is in the code? What are, and, and generally what you're going to be looking for are things like these jumps and these um, and the kind of like where we're jumping to and like, are there if else's, are there loops? So here we've got, so we got the compare just like before and we have a jump, you might expect JG to mean jump greater, but it's a little weird, right? Instead of doing a jump, we're not comparing to five, we're comparing to, we're comparing to four. Why? Well, if param uh, one is less than five, 
then the opposite of that, then if it's, so if it's not less than five, then it's greater than four. Okay, so what we're actually doing is we're saying if param one is greater than four, so this is where the kind of reversed, um, the reversed compare happens. If param one is greater than four, then we're going to skip this section, and then we're going to end up down here. So you gotta have to kind of have to follow the, the labels, right? So L6 is right here. So we will skip over the then section into the else section. Okay. Now what if it what if we didn't take the jump? So what if param uh, what if param one was less than or equal to four, which is equivalent to less than five, right? It's an integer. So less than or equal to four is going to be equivalent to less than five, then what we do is we, we do the or um, from the then case, but now we don't want to execute the else section, right? We have kind of two pieces here, so we don't want to execute the else section, so we need this unconditional jump. We're going to skip over the else section down here. And then we do the neg, the neg is arithmetic negation, so negative of that. So we can see the difference between the if then and the if else. Um, with the, just a single if then and no else, we can just we can do that with a single jump that just kind of skips over the block of code if the condition is is not met. With the if else, we've got um, we've got to kind of do this slightly more complicated thing where I, I check the condition um, possibly by changing it up a little, and then I need this unconditional jump to skip over the else. Question? Question. Yeah. So dot L is preserved for locations? Uh, so the question is, is the dot L uh, preserved? So you, you can't make a name in C that starts with a dot. So the, the compiler just kind of uses anything that starts with a dot as just a way for it to use um, for these are called I guess they're called labels um, so uh, it, it's going to use dot l and some number for labels um, in GDB and I hope like I'll, I'll show you at the end real quick with in GDB what it looks like it's not going to be um, you're not going to see these dot l things you're going to see actual addresses but um, we're we're looking at it at a, at a point kind of before that so in this case we're seeing we're seeing the dot l's when we actually go through the disassemble we'll see what it looks like Anything else? Okay. All right. So now uh, let's let's do let's do a loop. Yeah. So let's do a loop. Int while loop. Int n. Um, so here I'm just going to say, so this is just going to be some simple loop that's going to sum up, uh, and then I'll say int i is equal to 1, and I'll just sum up the numbers from 1 to n, right? So I'll say, well, y, well i is less than n, I'm just going to add i, and then I'm going to increment, increment it. So you could say, well, we could write this as a for loop, I'll show you what it looks like as a for loop later. Fine. So here I've got my while loop. We're just going to sum from the numbers from 1 to n. Yeah? So let's look at that over here. So we've got the, we've got the initialization. So here's where maybe where the, well, okay, let me, let me just walk through the, the idea here first. We've got the initialization of the variable sum and i. You'll notice they got flipped, by the way. Um, it gets to the, the compiler gets to initialize these in whatever order it wants. So it initialized the i, it initialized i first, and then initialized sum. Okay, well, whatever. And then here is the body of the loop. Oh, uh, I should just do something different. I'm just gonna have, actually have it return sometimes too, um, to get rid of that, that weird thing. Okay. Uh, so here is the body of the loop. Right there. 
right? Um, where this is a little surprising, and if we have a chance, we'll go into what it means, um, why why this is kind of happening, but. You might expect the first thing to do that we would want to do with this loop is the condition. And so you might expect the condition to show up up here um, for actually for optimization reasons. GCC will never generate that loop. What it actually wants to do is it wants to put the condition down here. So, okay, well, let's just, let's trace through it, right? Like the best we can do is just walk through the assembly and see if it's actually doing what we want. So we're going to jump. First, we're going to just unconditionally jump to L9. Just boom, right down there. Okay. Well, so now we compare uh, EDX, which is where uh, I is stored, right? We can see that uh, I, one got put into EDX at the beginning, so that's where I is. And as long as uh, I is less than N, so there's the jump less than, we're going to jump back up to L10. I don't know why I put them out of order. So that's the body of the loop. This section is, you know, the add and the add of the two values. And then if there's no jump, even if you see a label, you're just going to keep going. Right? We, like the code, if there's no instruction that says go somewhere else, you just keep going straight like to the next instruction over and over. So after this add, we will go, we will keep on going and hit this compare. Then we'll see this jump less. And if it's less again, then we come back up. And then we keep going. Then when we're finally done, we've got this jump less. If we're not less, if I is not less than N anymore, then we don't take the jump, meaning we just continue and execute the next line. So I'm gonna do a little, I'll try the colorize and see how that goes. I'm actually gonna, yeah, okay, that's, all right, I need to get rid of some of this code. Is circus. Yeah. Uh, all right, well, then that's too bad that I can't get this. OK, so now the color eye should be better. OK, it's a little better. Um, you can at least kind of see how the lines sort of line up here. You can see the two initializations. You can see the, the you can see the the test kind of got split here, right? So we, so to do the test at the beginning, we need to jump down to kind of the, to, we need to jump down here, and then here's where the bulk of the test is happening, and then here's where the two ads are, right? Now you might say, hey, you know, I mean, you wrote this as a while loop, and that's cool, but like, this is obviously better as a for loop, right? Because I mean, you're, you're just doing a kind of a normal increment. I'm going to turn off colorful. I changed it. Um, you, it's because you're just doing kind of a normal incrementing, uh, counter loop. Like I was taught that for loops make more sense, um, for the kind of normal counter control loop. So, okay, fine. Let's change it to a for loop and see what that does to the assembly. And I'll do this and I'll actually do it in place because otherwise, the colors are going to get messed up again. And then I'll get rid of this I++ now, right? Hey, look, the assembly didn't change. Right? Not at all. Um, as it turns out, there's not any kind of special assembly directive for for loop versus while loop versus anything. Um, if we have a for loop in C, it's just going to get translated, as you'd expect, to the while loop with an initialization of a test and update. And now if I do the colorize, it's actually going to be, it's, it's a kind of a pretty interesting result here where you actually see that a lot of these instructions are because of this for loop, right? So this line is responsible for quite a few of those instructions, but they are not in the same place. Not only are there more than, is there more than one instruction for this loop, it's here and here and down here and in here. But that's what a for loop is, right? A for loop is an initialization. We set I, start with I being one. It's a test. And then it's an update. And so we can actually see those three pieces kind of split up, um, kind of splitting this lot, one line of C code into its constituent pieces when we've compiled it to assembly.
Questions? Why some set after i? The question is why some set after i? Because the compiler gets to make that call. Um, it, as long as both of them are initialized before we start doing anything, um, the compiler is allowed to do that. Right? It, it doesn't really matter in terms of the functioning of the code. This is going to be something that we'll, we'll address later on, which is you know, at what point is the, what are the things that the compiler is allowed to do? And the, the reality is, well, if nobody's looking, the compiler gets to kind of assume you're not looking at the assembly. So maybe we're you know, kind of playing some games behind its back here. But it, the, the compiler gets to assume that you're not scrutinizing every line of assembly it's generating. And that as long as it produces code that is consistent with or it produces assembly that is consistent with the code that you wrote, that as long as it does the right thing, that it's allowed to kind of reorder things, it's allowed to kind of change stuff up. And so it just decided that, that maybe that was more efficient, maybe that it was just, I don't know, for some reason it was easier for us to do that. Question? Yep. If you pre-increment i instead of post-increment, will that change the assembly? Aha, uh -huh. so we can try that. Uh, in C, certainly not. In C++, pre-increment, post-increment is a lot different. But yeah, I mean, we're not actually using the result, right? So the pre-increment, post-increment wouldn't matter. Um, anything else? Okay. So I want to actually show you this in GDB. One of the big reasons I want to show you this in GDB is you'll notice if we actually tried to line up assembly instructions to line numbers, it's actually pretty hard now. Right? We, we have you know, this, the init of the for loop happening, and then we go back and initialize sum, and then we go back to the for loop. Let's see how GDB handles that. So I've got this exact code. I'm not going to pull up the code because the code is exactly the same. Uh, in the program control. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to do this. Uh, let me put a breakpoint first on for loop. And I'm actually going to use this really cool layout. This is called TUI. We'll introduce it to next week in lab. You'll get all the chances to play with it. But we actually get to do this in GDB, where it splits up your window. It's showing you both the, it's showing you some assembly down here. It's showing you the code up here. And I'm going to run it so that we can actually get, we can get somewhere. And you can kind of see how this works, right? So here the kind of arrow is telling us where we are executing the instruction. There's a corresponding arrow in the assembly view. And the highlighted line, this line has yet to be executed. OK? So here we can see the actual code that's, that's being run, the, the assembly that, that we saw of moving a 1 into uh, ED, EDX there. And presumably, that's executing on behalf of int i equals 1. Now, I could use step and next to move in terms of lines of C code, but that's not, but if we're trying to look at the assembly and we're trying to walk through the assembly instruction by instruction, that's not going to be as useful. So we're going to use a different instruction now, SI or step I, they're equivalent, right? Um, the, it's just a short, SI would be a shorthand. And what this is going to do is it's going to take me one instruction at a time, assembly instruction. So if I do a step i, you see that I moved to the next instruction. And here's where you get to see kind of the weird thing happening in C code. Just like we saw in GCC Explorer, we actually jumped back up in C code. And so if you were debugging this normally with a step, right, you, just, you, you, didn't, you weren't looking at the assembly, and you just hit next, and it moved to a previous line, you might have thought, what the heck? Like, why did it do that? Right? Like, shouldn't it be executing my code in the order that it's coming out. But we saw that it kind of didn't matter in this case. So, and we look at the assembly and we see that um, it, it doesn't, it, it's generating in a different order. And so now we can see that, and so now we can step I again. And you can see that we, we're now back to the for loop um, and we're, we're, we're on to the, we're onto the jump. Okay, um, so quickly before I, I talk about the jump and how to read the jump, we can print out EDX. We expect the value to be 1 because we just moved 1 into EDX, which is I. And you can see that um, 
the, the window is getting a little bit garbled here, um, but you can see that EDI is one, or EDX is one, I'm sorry. Okay, so now we can look at this jump. And we can say, how do we read this jump? There's no convenient label. There's nothing that just says, hey, by the way, you know, jump to L, whatever. What we're actually saying to jump to is we're saying jump to this address in memory. So if I look on the left hand side and I look for the plus for the FE, that's here, right? So this jump says jump the next instruction that we should execute. This is an unconditional jump. The next instruction that we should execute is this one. And then moreover, um, you can look over, look inside here. This may be a little bit easier to read the number off of, um, but it's, so plus 17 is, is right there as well. So you can kind of match up either of those. All right? So if I do the SI, you can see that I am now, you know, I did actually take that jump. Ah, yes, okay, so there everything is kind of messed up. The GDB, uh, TY kind of, gets into that situation. Sometimes you just have to do that. Did it get better? Yeah. Good, good. So sometimes it kind of likes to garble your, your window a little bit. Maybe if you highlight stuff, I don't know. Um, but if it ever gets in that situation, you can type refresh, and that'll just kind of redraw the whole screen. Okay. So now, in fact, we did, we did jump. We did not continue um, to the next instruction. We went down to this uh, 4FE, 4 loop plus 17, and now we can do this comp. And we can kind of keep walking through it so we can see that um, comparing EDX to EDI, so if I SI to allow the compare to happen, then, wow, it really is unhappy today. Let's go back into it. I want to get out of that with Control X, Control A, um, we'll get, and then we'll come back into it, and that should actually help. Okay, so here we go. Um, so, okay, the compare, was EDX to EDI. I'm reading it sort of the correct direction, right? So if I print out dollar $EDX, well, actually, we saw it up there. It was one. So I'm not going to print that out, but I want to do EDI. Um, I ran this thing with n equals three. So the compare, so EDX is less than EDI, so we will, so we will take the jump. So if I do an SI, we do go back up. You see that we came back up to the to where the target was, F9, and we can kind of keep going. So here we could look at EDX again. We see that it's two. Right, we come back up. Now we're at three, oops. Oh, okay. Let it go too far. My bad. Um, so I accidentally used an N instead of a, an, an, an I there. But um, so what happens after we have a what happens after the the jump the less is no the the compare is no longer less than we've got uh, EDX and EDI are both three now, right? And so now we just continue um, to the end and we go through this ret queue and you see that. Yeah, and once we hit the ret queue, that's or ret, which is ret queue in GDB, then we're we're out of. We will we will leave this function, and then we'll go back to main, and I won't look at me. Okay, so hopefully that gave you a kind of rough idea of some of the control structures and some of the issues that come up there. If we um, when we come back, we'll talk maybe about a couple more uh, little little pieces that I need to get to, and then continue with function calls. Yeah. Thanks for the lecture. Yeah. Um.